We wanted to uh, present this series about the Constitution of the Cherokee Nation specifically uh, because so many of our current issues are impacted uh, by this and there's a real history. I'm particularly uh, interested in the issues of residency and especially of um, the requirements for, for citizenship in the Cherokee Nation. So, those are things that we would um, expect to see defined in the Constitution. And so those are two of the areas that uh, I will focus on, not only tonight, but throughout the four-part series um, that, that we'll be doing. So let's go ahead and get started. I think uh, the, the um, procedure here was that if you have questions at any point, about any point in the presentation, maybe just jot them down because um, I think we're not going to be accepting questions until the end, uh, and then um, you'll be able to type them in at that time. So just so you don't forget in the interim, maybe make a note of any questions that you may have. Uh, we have to go all the way back to the 1700s, I think, to begin understanding how a constitution came about. And uh, um, there's an era that I refer to to as um, the, the era of Cherokee nationalism. You see, it's about 36 years, approximately. Uh, and so it just leaves it in mind for us that constitutions don't come into existence overnight. It takes uh, a long time for something like this to, to emerge. So there are qu two questions that, um, that we probably have to consider in laying the groundwork for this. And the first is, why did the government of the Cherokees evolve to a more centralized government in the 1700s to begin with people uh, suddenly arrive at a constitution? So the response to the first is simply, I think, to go through it quickly, just that there are colonizing forces that are really um, sort of You're demanding missed. a response on the, I'm sorry. Are you all hearing me? No, Julia, everybody's supposed to be muted. Uh, the hearing is just fine, yeah. keep going. Keep going. Okay, okay. Because um, mine is saying there's an unstable internet connection, so I don't know, but I am hearing myself in the background somewhat. Um, the government of the Cherokees evolved because there are colonial forces that are just pushing uh, on the Cherokees to do that in the sense we our, our very decentralized structure is being used against us and so uh, by the British and later by the Americans and so it really just becomes kind of a strategy to do things like um, you know, designate one person that's going to represent all of the Cherokees to those colonizing forces and um, establish a, a grand council that takes a larger sort of legislative authority away from the individual town councils in order that the nation can speak with one voice rather than, you know, um, just sort of regional voices oftentimes. So there has been this push toward centralization for several decades already. Um, but then by uh, 1791, uh, we really do um, get into speaking in terms of nationality. And the first time that we see this language uh, it comes up in a treaty in 1791. Um, and right from the preamble, it says a treaty of peace and friendship made and concluded between the President of the United States on part and behalf of the states, and then the other undersigned chiefs and warriors of the Cherokee Nation of Indians, on the other hand, on behalf of the said nation. Now, the Cherokees had already made, I think, 11 treaties before this, 10 with Great Britain and one with the United States. And in all of those previous treaties, the word nation had never been used uh, in reference to the Cherokees. So this is the first time that the Cherokees are beginning to assert 
nationality in a political sense. And we see it in the first articles of that treaty. Again, they reiterate this, that this is the, the individuals of the whole Cherokee nation of Indians and that the Cherokee nation places itself under the uh, protection of um, the United States. And so this language of nationality had never been used before. And ever since 1791, it has never not been used. Uh, with a couple of exceptions, and in those instances when, when there were exceptions, it was because either the group negotiating the treaty was not the government, <laughs> and some of these are because of um, old settlers being parties to some treaties, or most famously or infamously probably in the Treaty of New Echota when uh, it it's very clearly not people from the government negotiating that. But with those exceptions, everything else ever since has said the Cherokee Nation, the Cherokee Nation, the Cherokee Nation. And I think at this time that the Cherokee Nation steps forward and really uh, makes these assertions of nationality because uh, they are seeing right in front of their eyes this example of the United States itself. The United States has basically just come out of nowhere, you know? These were uh, people that used to be British and all of a sudden they said, no, we're not that anymore. Now we're the United States. Now we are a separate nation. And there seems to be a, a sense on the part of the Cherokees to some extent that we'll, okay, we'll, we'll meet that in kind. If they can do that, we can do that. Um, they can proclaim a separate nationality, then that's what we'll do too. And uh, it, it, it's a strategy, really, at a time when uh, the military options are really closing for them. It's been demonstrated to them in the Revolutionary War that they really can't fight that way anymore and with much expectation of success. And so they're looking for legal and political ways um, to carry on their resistance. These proclamations of nationality we go next and, you know, as we all know, I think we begin to have some written laws beginning in 1808 that the Cherokee Nation begins to establish um, a legislative uh, body, um, body of law, and, um, and that we do begin to structure our government again to a point where we start to have uh, um, uh, a more centralized legislature, legislature council, I guess, that begins to meet um, in a couple of places, actually, and then uh, sort of coalesces around a place called Ustanala, which uh, later becomes known as New Echota. But uh, although they continue to make these efforts toward centralization and toward building law and a body of law, we don't have anything like a constitution yet. Um, but beginning in 1817 and continuing for about a decade, we begin to see some really strong moves in that direction. And it really is in response to a betrayal um, by Andrew Jackson. We had assisted him uh, in several battles against um, sort of dissident Creeks. Uh, in the War of 1812 and the War with the Southern Tribes. And the promise on the part of Jackson was that there would be no land sessions demanded from the Cherokees, you know. But that promise is broken almost immediately afterwards. He tries to demand sessions of land um, in treaties and in 1816 was successful in doing that. And it really shocked the Cherokees. It was considered a huge betrayal. And so they thought, we have really got to do something here to, to begin to shore ourselves up and, and just start acting really as one body at this time. So they begin to do that, and uh, we'll go through some of the laws that they pass um, in these years, these 10 years or so afterwards, that start to do some of the things uh, that we would normally expect would be done in the Constitution. And some have called these reforms, especially some reforms that were made in 1825, the de facto first Cherokee Constitution. 
So some of the subjects that would be do, um, addressed in the Constitution, first of all, uh, land. Uh, we want to shore up our title to the land. That is something that we absolutely began to put in that um, fundamental document. And there are two principles that were reiterated over and over and over, first legislatively and then in Constitution. First of all, that our land is held in common. Um, no individual owns our land as a private citizen. And, uh, and so this was uh, intended to make it very, very difficult, impossible really, for individual citizens to sell off um, small parcels of land and, and ultimately whittle down the landscape. The second concept uh, that was very fundamental is that that land base is semi-privatized, however. People could establish use rights, use areas uh, that would be exclusive to those individuals. And, um, and once they did that, once they established themselves, no one else could move on to a piece of land that an individual was using. So they did have a use right to the land. They just didn't have, a, you know, sort of a real estate right that they could sell it. They could transfer it to, you know, um, their their descendants, um, to their heirs, um, but they just could not sell it. Government is the other thing that is often addressed in a constitution, and so we have. Uh, the, the structure of government beginning to be outlined legislatively and then uh, constitutionally later on. So it lays out in these uh, acts of reforms beginning in 1817 that um, we are a bicameral legislature. We have a national council, uh, which is the body that ultimately, that, that sort of ulti has the ultimate authority, if you will. They are the ones who are um, authorized to enter into treaties. They are the body that is authorized to pass laws. Um, but out of that National Council, uh, which ultimately or, uh, uh, in the beginning comprised 40 members, there are 13 of them who were sort of peeled off, who were um, then designated as the National Committee. And that National Committee um, was sort of a cabinet is sometimes how it's been described. They tended to be um, the bilingual members of the tribe. They spoke English, almost all of them. Uh, they were people who had some experience in finance. Uh, they were um, people who were more acculturated oftentimes. And they were the ones who um, kept the, um, the treasury. Uh, they were the ones who gave the legal language in English to the uh, first laws. So it was sort of a strategic uh, system where you've got some of your more acculturated members kind of handling the things that needed those particular kinds of skills to be handled. Um, but they always had to, um, the, the National Council is the body that has the ultimate say so on things. So while the committee might give the legal language to the law, the committee had to work strategically with the more traditional members of the council in order to finally get that law passed. And, uh, and that really ensures that in an era where you do need adaptation, that the adaptation does not kind of come at the traditional members too fast and too furiously, um, that there's that there's a melding uh, of the two sensibilities oftentimes. Um, the nation was divided into um, voting districts uh, in these years, um, something we had never done before, and that needed to be done because they implemented a system of elections, which had also never been done before. We had never voted for our chiefs. They had always been chosen by a consensus uh, in town councils. And so, um, so the process of even holding elections with the first ones being held in 1817 was brand new to everybody. And, um, and it's a really interesting process. I'm just gonna go off on a little tangent here because um, one of the things we know about the early laws and the early constitutions is that women did not vote. 
And uh, that had that was certainly very different from the traditional system of women being very involved in choosing uh, the chiefs previous to this time. But the vote was a very open vote. People would travel for miles and miles sometimes to go to one location in their voting district. And um, the candidate would stand in front of the people and the people would vote very publicly just by raising their hand at that moment when the name of the individual candidates were called out. And so everybody saw it. And I think in these very early years, when only men voted, but the women are standing on the sidelines and watching those men as they vote, you will not convince me that those women were not in there as part of a process of households deciding collectively how those men were going to vote. And those women were watching to make sure that they followed what, what the decision of the entire household had been. So the process of elections is also one that is meshed, I think, very much with for traditional charity structures. The things that, um, that are really become interesting in constitutions are the residency requirements. This is an era when we are losing a lot of land by treaty and increasingly uh, what becomes defined by statute and by these sessions of land is that the people who vote in these voting districts are the people who continue to live in those voting districts. In other words, those who continue to live within the remaining boundaries of the nation. Cherokees who were outside of those boundaries um, just did not vote in those districts. There were some individuals who were able to hold reserves outside of the boundaries. Um, and that's just kind of an interesting fact. It doesn't have a whole lot to do with this particular presentation, but it definitely contributes to some, some of the reasons why we separate ultimately and, and become two governments, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and the, the Cherokee Nation. The process of citizenship is one that is very interesting throughout these, um, these years because um, because um, the Cherokees really begin to define it, especially uh, as in a couple of ways around the question of political adoption. Uh, Cherokees had always adopted outsiders into the tribe that had been done through ceremony and adoption these clans. But beginning here, we're, we can have a political adoption of individuals who are not adopted into clans and the, the, uh, the adoption is not achieved through ceremony. And we'll, We'll see in the next slide how they begin to do that. So beginning in 1819, we see some laws being passed. This is not in a constitution, but, um, but laws to address the phenomena of white men um, intermarrying with Cherokees and living within the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. So one of the early laws says that they have to obtain a marriage license from the national clerk and be formally married by a minister before acquiring the right, the right of citizenship. And we start to see this word of political membership, citizenship, that begins to be used very, you know, very commonly in legislation, in treaties. Um, they're talking about citizens in the early 1800s and all throughout that century. Uh, the white man loses citizenship when parting from white. So here we begin to see some of the restrictions around intermarried whites uh, becoming political citizens of the nation. Um, there has to be some kind of a formal marriage uh, that takes place. And it's a limited citizenship. If that marriage ends, as many of them did, um, that white man loses their, his citizenship um, as a result of that, does not continue uh, to have voting rights or any other rights. Uh, within the Cherokee Nation. Um, it's six years later, we get some adjustment of the norms of the clan system. We are a matrilineal people. And so traditionally to this point, the only people who would really have been considered Cherokee would have been the children of Cherokee women. And, um, and here, because of some um, um, political power bases within the Ridge and Boudinot families in particular. Um, the sons of those families, those women, 
uh, in that family had married uh, white women. And because these are families who are sort of hoping to build a political dynasty, when, the, when John Ridge and Elias Boudinot in particular marry white women, this kind of throws the potential for that dynasty uh, into uh, chaos. And so being members of the National Council, they're able to, to take care of this by passing a law legislatively, which says that, well, from now on, um, we're, we're going to add on essentially to the clan system and say it's not only the children of Cherokee women, but now it will also be the children of Cherokee men and white women specifically, it says, who will be considered and incorporated as citizens of the Cherokee Nation as well. So those of us today who have Cherokee fathers um, are, are very relieved that uh, this uh, began to, to be accepted. This is the article, the law that was passed in 1825. This is the one that really indicates that they are beginning to think about what would we include uh, in a constitution. They're thinking about what are the most important things, the things that go beyond laws, which can be changed, but, we're, but which are really the things that we would want to set in stone, which is what a constitution does. So they go to the things that we've talked about, the lands are the common property of the, of the nation. Um, they talk about um, the annuities, which are public property. Uh, all of these kinds of things that have to do with what is considered to be collective property, whether it's land, whether it's finance, financial, uh, whatever it may be, right? And they're starting to talk about these kinds of things. They're starting to think, if we look at the seventh and eighth articles, they're starting to think about jurisdictions. Um, and uh, what does the judiciary, um, you know, what kind of power can it uh, assert beyond that of the council and the executive? Now, this process throughout the 1820s of moving through or moving toward a constitution was not um without challenges there is a cherokee member of the national council an individual named white path uh one of the more conservative members of the national council and he like many other conservative cherokees is sort of of the feeling like well this is kind of white man stuff why do we need to be doing something like this you know and we're we're making rather dramatic changes to our government actually and 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 we're not exactly understanding why or what the need for this is so there is a, a movement of resistance throughout these years in the 1820s the activities of um of the rebellion i mean it's it's you know it's not a rebellion where they picked up arms or nobody's killed in the in the process of this rebellion but but they targeted the missionaries primarily. That it seems that the missionaries became sort of a symbol of acculturation. And, uh, and they are the ones who bear the brunt of this rebellion. Um, so they, the, the, these conservative individuals begin to disrupt um, church services. They start to disrupt some of the revivals and the camp missionary, uh, the camp um, uh, meetings that the missionaries are holding, these kinds of things. Um, but it, it seems that it was mainly a, uh, a rebellion of needing more information because, as I said, White Path is on the council and as he and more acculturated members of the, uh, the council begin to work with each other and talk with each other and the more acculturated members begin to talk more with the conservative members. Um, it seems that gradually more and more understanding begins to build even among the conservative people about what we're really trying to achieve as as a whole as a nation um, by by making these kinds of changes and so in the end many people would consider the rebellion to have been a success because it ultimately kind of pulls in the more acculturated people um, 
the, the more progressive members of the National Council actually wanted to go much, much further with some of the constitutional changes than what was, um, than what was set in stone in 1827. And, and they didn't. Um, the, the rebellion kind of reined them in. And in the end, uh, the 1827 Constitution doesn't really go much further uh, than what they had already been moving toward for the last 10 years. So people were, had kind of been getting accustomed to it all. Um, in 1827, uh, we do finally reach the, the moment of Constitution. And um, I sort of consider this, I think of this as kind of the full fruition of the 36 years of, you know, ri rising indigenous nationalist sentiment is, is usually the way I characterize it. Um, the document does set in stone some of the most defining principles of government around land, uh, government, uh, citizenship, and residency, um, especially land government and, and citizenship, I think. And uh, these are among the most basic expressions of sovereignty that any government holds. Sovereignty is often defined as the right to decide for, for itself, you know, that the nation decides for itself um, and, and sets the criteria. But at that moment, we're in a constitutional crisis, or I'm sorry, we're in a removal crisis rather. And so um, legislating is, is more or less suspended beginning around 1829, um, as all of the Cherokee Nation's efforts focus on simply not being removed. And as we know, those efforts, it was a, a valiant fight, but ultimately the nation was not successful um, in that resistance. And so in 1838 into 1839, the whole of the Cherokee Nation is, is removed to the Indian Territory. I've often been really impressed by the fact that in the encampments in the southeast, where we had been rounded up and held for a couple of months before the removal actually begins, um, on the eve, literally the evening, before the majority of the people, the largest detachments were leaving in October, the members of the National Council met in the encampment. And one of the questions that they discussed before they broke up into these, um, these detachments and began to head out was when we get to the Indian Territory, are we going to continue with constitutional government? Because they recognized that at that moment, it was the perfect moment if they wanted to make changes of some sort, when everything is gonna to have to be rebuilt anyway, this is the time to do it, right? So are we gonna rebuild something different or are we going to continue down this path that we've been on for over 40 years now, uh, by 1839? And they made a very conscious decision that no, we're going on with constitutional government. There's, we still felt that this was the, the strongest way to sort of continue our legal and political battle uh, to hold on to, um, to sovereignty. So, um, so that uh, the Constitution was developed in the Indian Territory. Um, the meetings around it begin in July of 1839, only four months after the last, last detachment had arrived. And so that, that also tells you what a priority this was for those people, because it's a moment when we've got to rebuild everything. People don't have homes, we're, we don't have crops, we're reliant on food for the, from the United States. And, and yet in the midst of all of that, we're going to sit down and develop a constitution to govern by. Um, the first article of that constitution in this, uh, Article 1, Section 2 reaffirms that the land, lands of the Cherokee Nation shall com are common property, uh, but the improvements that are made belong to the citizens uh, uh, themselves. However, that article also says that the citizens possess no right or power to dispose of their improvements to the United States, to individual states, or to individual U.S. citizens. So people can't sell their things. They can't sell 
anything <laughs> to uh, citizens of the United States, to the United States, not without the approval of the National Council. Um, the anticipation is that just as in the Southeast, we're going to be developing lucrative businesses and other kinds of, of um, resources. And, um, and the Cherokees don't want those passing into the hands of non-Cherokees. Now this map is interesting because the highlighted part is, is what we're familiar with is the historic Cherokee Nation. But I do want to remind you of the huge swath across to the West uh, that is designated as number 489. We owned that too after the 1828 treaty. And so uh, that also, the Cherokee outlet also falls under uh, this, this constitution of 1839. Article 1, Section 2 also has some other things about residency in it. It says, whenever any citizen removes with his effects out of the limits of this nation and becomes a citizen of any other government, all his rights and privileges as a citizen of this nation shall cease. So here we see the, the, the map of, you know, the Cherokee Nation proper in the 1800s. I mean, Claremore, Vanita, um, Bartlesville, et cetera, all of these towns, with the exception of Tahlequah, didn't exist at that time, Tahlequah and Fort Gibson, but, but nevertheless, that, that was the territory. So what uh, Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution was saying was that if you're going to be a citizen and vote in elections, for instance, um, you've got to live within this boundary. If you live anywhere outside of it and you stay outside of it for more than six months, they said, um, then you are considered to have abandoned your citizenship and you are considered to have abandoned your, um, your use rights to any portion of this land. But they do give a way out. They say the National Council shall have the power to readmit by law any such person who may desire to return to the nation. And in the late 1800s in particular, we had lots and lots of charities, literally thousands of them, who had left the nation for various reasons at various moments in time, and who returned, um, particularly during the allotment era, um, to be reincorporated as citizens of, that, of this government. Article 2, Section 1 uh, is just establishing that once again, we've got a tripartite system, the legislative, the executive, executive and the judicial branches. And then also in Article 6, Section 6, 6 7, and 9, um, we have somewhat of a Bill of Rights, uh, which included protections against double jeopardy, the right to a trial by jury, and also freedom of religion. But it's interesting that in the Cherokee Constitution in the 1800s, there was no freedom of speech guaranteed constitutionally, um, no freedom of the press guaranteed constitutionally. These things were not placed into the Constitution because beginning almost immediately, the, the tensions and conflict between the old settlers, the people who were already there, and those from, who had just arrived from the East is already beginning. Um, and we had tensions after the Civil War and, uh, you know, just, it, it was always um, a, a potentially combustible situation, I think. And um, they had a lot of concerns about freedom of speech and, and freedom of the press in particular. Now those are the things that are in the Constitution and then other things uh, around Cherokee citizens, citizenship were handled legislatively, uh, simply by passing laws. Laws can be changed much more quickly, much more easily than a Constitution can be. So they, they sort of elaborated uh, the status of intermarried whites. They said intermarried whites would be citizens of the Cherokee Nation only so long as the marriage existed. If the marriage ended, then the white spouse lost their citizenship. If the Cherokee spouse died, the white spouse retained citizenship only if there were children of the marriage. So the principle seemed to be that in order for a Cherokee, or I'm sorry, in order for a non-Cherokee, um, an intermarried white, and I think probably an Indian of another tribe as well, 
to be a citizen of this government, they had to have familial connections to people who were Cherokees. Either they were the spouse of a Cherokee citizen or they were the parent of a Cherokee citizen. So the Cherokees had also during these years passed anti-miscegenation laws prohibiting intermarriage between Cherokees and Africans in the 1820s. But even as they had done so, I think the first, first laws are, uh, addressing this were passed in about 1825. They had grandfathered into citizenship some mixed Af Cherokee African people uh, who had already been born previous, not pervious, but previous <laughs> to the law's passage. Uh, most notably, the adult children of a man who was named Chulio. He was also called Shoe Boots, and he was a member uh, of the National Council. So he really implored the National Council to uh, accept his children already born into citizenship, and they did. But the rather amazing thing is that after this, the, uh, the Cherokee National Council actually said to Shoe Boots, you are not to have more children with your wife. And if you do, they will not be accepted as citizens of the Cherokee Nation. And it just seems unimaginable to us that, you know, a government directing to an individual citizen uh, that it cannot have children, that that citizen cannot have children with their spouse. Um, and really what they're saying is not that you can't, but that you have to know that your children will not be citizens of this government. It's a tragic story because um, Shubut spends the remainder um, or much of his um, of his remaining years um, trying to um, to recover his children because he had five ultimately and they were all um, uh, captured and, and um, um, taken into slavery by whites in the south and he spent much of the rest of his life trying to recover them. Um, I'm not going to go into this a whole lot, it's not the central point of this presentation, but there are several possible explanations that scholars have conceived for the differences uh, in the ways that intermarriage between whites versus intermarriage uh, with Africans was handled uh, in the pre-removal era by, uh, by Cherokees. Um, Theda Perdue, who is a very noted historian, I've heard her state this about history generally, she says, we'll never know what the correct theories are, we, we weren't there, you know, so anything uh, that we say is just theorizing and nothing really definitive can probably be said. However, um, as we know, Cherokee, some individual Cherokees um, were slave owners and the Cherokee Nation was a government that, that permitted slaveholding. Um, and in 1863, uh, following the lead of the United States, the Cherokee Nation does uh, free its slaves and passes an emancipation proclamation. And you can read through this for yourselves. Um, it talks about, you know, we're basically that we are following the lead of the United States and um, we agree with the emancipation proclamation of the United States and, and we're going to thereafter abolish and forever cease um, to allow of slavery within the Cherokee Nation. Um, we're going to make it unlawful, et cetera, et cetera. And it says, and any person who uh, shall be found guilty of holding a slave or slave uh, shall be fined going forward in this nation. And that any slave in bondage at this time shall forevermore uh, be free. Um, and then they talk about the duty of the solicitors to enforce the law. Um, and what will happen if the solicitors don't enforce the law. And this is the language of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and you'll note that by omission, uh, the, the, the freed slaves of the Cherokees are not specifically incorporated into citizenship here. And there's nothing in our laws and nothing in our constitution um, that, that said that. Um, so it, it's kind of a situation of, of limbo, uh, 
And this is a very specific act, in fact, on the part of the Cherokee Nation to not specifically address this. Uh, three years later, this is at the conclusion of the Civil War, the Cherokees have fought on both sides uh, of this conflict, the majority having fought with the Union. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there is a very punitive treaty uh, that is imposed by the federal government on the Cherokee Nation in 1866, and there are a number of aspects of it. We had to give up land, uh, we had to give up rights of way, uh, we had to incorporate um, people from other tribes into our territory. Uh, I, I just, I mean, every, pretty much without exception, every uh, analysis of this treaty is that it was, um, it was taking retribution on the Cherokees because a portion of, of the tribe had sided with the Confederacy. But there are three articles in particular that deal with issues that, that we would normally address in a constitution. And these are the issues, again, of citizenship criteria. And so in Article 9, we see um, the language of the 1866 treaty, which I think many of you are familiar with. And what I want to call your attention to is that um, all free colored persons who were residents or who may return within six months and their descendants shall have all of the rights of native Cherokee, right? So um, it's interesting language. We're going to look at the actual constitutional amendment in a moment. The rights of native Cherokees is the ambiguity of this treaty, right? may mean citizenship, but it could mean other things too. Um, it could mean, mean use of fruct rights to a portion of the land base. It could mean, you know, any number of things. Um, and it really doesn't specify um, very clearly what, what this is. One of the things is that this is a limitation. In order for the descendants of freedmen to claim rights within the Cherokee Nation, they must either be in the Cherokee Nation at this time and have been there previous to the war breaking out, or if they were there previous to the war breaking out and they've left, they have to come back within six months. And this is quite frankly an attempt on the part of the Cherokee Nation to limit the numbers of freedmen that they will incorporate um, as people who have rights, whatever that means. Um, they're betting that like the Cherokees themselves, most freedmen or many freedmen had fled the nation and um, they're hoping they won't hear about it uh, in time and, and return. That's, that's what they're betting on, quite frankly. Articles 15 and 16 are addressing two other people um, who ultimately were settled into the Cherokee Nation. Uh, Article 15 is saying that uh, the United States can settle in these civilized Indians of other tribes, this is, who are friendly with the Cherokees and adjacent tribes on unoccupied lands east of 96 degrees. 96 degrees is the part, um, the, the dividing line kind of between the Cherokee Nation proper and the Cherokee outlet. And um, so this is saying that Indians that meet two criteria, they're friendly and they're civilized, that they can be settled into the Cherokee Nation proper. Article 16 says that the United States can settle any friendly Indians in uh, any part of the Cherokee country west of 96 degrees. So here they're talking about the Cherokee outlet. And you see that the, the criteria is somewhat different because they say if you're friendly but you're not that civilized maybe, you know, then you get settled uh, to the West. And, um, and this is just, uh, the criteria really what civilized meant in this era more than anything is, uh, is if you're not a sedentary and agricultural people, that you are rather uh, a more migratory hunting and gathering, predominantly hunting and gathering people. That's the distinction that was being made between civilized versus not civilized. Very arbitrary distinction. So here we have the actual constitutional amendments to 1866 that were required 
um, to bring the 18 or the 1839 Constitution into conformity with what we had promised and what we were bound by now under the 1856 Treaty. So the amendments to Article 3, Section 5, um, this says all native born Cherokees, all Indians of any tribe, right, and all whites who are legal mem legally members of the nation by adoption, and now also including all freedmen who have been liberated, um, as well as all free colored persons who were in the country at the commencement of the rebellion and are now residents or who may return within six months from the date of the treaty and their descendants who reside within the limits will become, and here they specifically say, citizens. This is not just rights and the ambiguity of rights. This is saying citizens. Okay. But you see all of the things that are part of the criteria. You have to live there. You have to have been there before the war broke out. You have to return within six months of July 19th, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of these criteria that are now in the Constitution. The, um, the Delaware uh, Agreement of 1867, this is the following year. This is when the Delawares who had been in a reservation in Kansas are, uh, are relocated and because they are friendly and civilized, right, sedentary agricultural people, uh, they will be settled within the boundaries uh, of the Cherokee Nation. And so they uh, will become members of the Cherokee Nation, the, the language says, with the same rights and immunities and the same participation in, in the national funds, the annuities and everything else as native Cherokees. Um, so this is the incorporation as citizens. I mean, this is, this is everything, um, all the rights, the same rights and immunities as native Cherokees. A couple years later, a similar agreement for, uh, with the Shawnees, uh, the people who were known as the loyal Shawnees. Uh, they too are relocated into the Cherokee Nation from Kansas um, and uh, become also citizens of the Cherokee Nation with all of the privileges and all of the immunities uh, of native citizens. So this was the situation in the latter part of the 1800s where we had a nation who had, that had sort of incorporated it in a limit, to a limited degree intermarried whites and, and Indians of other tribes. Um, you know, as long as familial connections with Cherokees were maintained. But after the 1866 treaty, the impositions on the part of the United States, um, I sort of, think is the criteria that it kind of made sense to us, you know, which had always been around sort of clan and family. Um, to an extent, they were, they were put aside. Um, and now um, we begin to incorporate people who do not necessarily uh, have those kinds of relationships. And I think, you know, I, I mean, who knows? This would just be my opinion and I won't state it, but there's probably you know, a, a different sensibilities within the people to begin with uh, as far as do we understand it this way or is this not comprehensible to some of our people because, you know, how, how do people who are not part of clans and families somehow become part of our, of our people, you know? And so, you know, you've, I, I just think you've got that probably those, um, those confusions and, and what ultimately results in in challenges, you know, that begin to come up at this point. Um, land is something that has always been addressed legislatively and in our constitutions, and we had thought we were shoring up our land just as strongly as we ever could, you know. Um, but as we know, the allotment is imposed upon us beginning in 1898 uh, through 1906. And um, there are legislations throughout those years, um, and the Dawes role uh, is uh, established as the defining role of citizenship at that time, um, citizenship in the nation. Um, the people that I kind of trust in, in terms of genealogy 
uh, who really are, I think, some of the best genealogists among the, the Cherokees, and I'll name names, David Hampton, Jack Baker, uh, people who really, really are very, very uh, cognizant of those roles. Um, I think they, you know, they look at, uh, at those roles and some of the anecdote about people being left off, uh, they don't see that much of it, at least in the Cherokee instance. And this may be because the Cherokees themselves did very extensive censuses, first in 1880 and then again in 1896, because we had incorporated so many additional people between 1880 and 1896 as citizens of our government. But every one of those applications for citizenship had gone through um, citizenship commissions in the Cherokee Nation. They had been approved, and so we knew uh, who they were very much. And, um, and I think that there's a strong feeling among many of the Cherokees who have really looked at these roles and studied them closely, that those roles do, in fact, indicate you know, probably 97, 98% correct in who the, the citizens of the Cherokee Nation are. But, uh, and so the land allotment is based on those roles and, and that common tribal land uh, ownership that we thought was going to be so strong and that had been so strong um, is it, suddenly broken up. And, um, and many people pretty quickly um, gain the right to sell it, which they hadn't had under uh, Cherokee constitutions. So there are a lot of things about land in all of the legislations that are passed throughout these years, uh, the allotment era. The final legislation of this era is called the Five Tribes Act. It's passed in 1906. It begins to sort of tie up the final affairs of the Cherokee Nation and of the individual allottees of the Cherokee Nation. And there are a couple of articles in it where the language says, after the approval of this act, no person shall be enrolled as a citizen or freedman of any of these five tribes. And what this seems to imply is that citizenship for anyone ends with the generation um, that is enrolled in, on the Dawes Rolls, that anybody born after those rolls just will not be enrolled as a citizen of any of these tribes, no one. So it's, and, and certainly that's kind of what was followed for many, many, many decades until um, probably the 1970s, I guess, and the 75 constitution would be the next time that that we begin to see any language about this. Now, the nation itself is, you know, continued by the same um, act, but after this generation on the Dawes Rolls, it seems that it's a nation without citizens is, is sort of to be the intent. It's just an, 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 a nation in name only, um, mainly for purposes of conveying resource. There's one thing about this language that maybe impacts us today. That's been one of the legal arguments in, in the Friedman cases recently, at least. There are earlier legal precedents in the Supreme Court from both the Cherokee tobacco case of 1870 and also the Lone Wolf versus Hitch, Hitchcock case of 1905 that pretty much say um, that Congress can nullify treaty rights uh, that if Congress can pick apart treaty rights simply by passing laws that say something contrary to what's in a treaty. So the argument on the part of some has been that although treaty rights, um, the Treaty of 1866 and then the Constitution of the Cherokee Nation clearly gave citizenship to freedmen in the last decades of the 1800s, um, and nobody really disputes that, um, going forward after this 1906 Act, there are different interpretations that exist uh, about whether that citizenship continues for the freedmen or for any of us. 
and um, and I'm not here to to state I believe this or I believe that. What I'm saying is, or what I'm trying to do is just to um, kind of introduce you to some of the the different arguments, the, the legal arguments that have been made. So. Um, this is a big jump from 1906 to 1975, but I think as many of us know, many of these years are, are referred to as the Dark Ages. Um, the Cherokee Nation kind of goes underground, if you will, at least politically, governmentally. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs begins to administer very heavily the affairs of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, we have chiefs who are appointed by the president, um, sometimes only for 24 hours, you know. Um, and it's, it's a very heavy-handed situation from the perspective of the Cherokee Nation. Sovereignty is just squelched. I mean, pretty completely uh, for decade after decade after decade. But by, 19, by the 1960s and, and into 1975, uh, there is an era of activism uh, that emerges. And while many groups within the United States are predicating their activism on civil rights, um, Indians are oftentimes predicating their activism on treaty rights. And so, um, so one of the things about the 1906 legislation was that it specifically continues um, the governments of the five tribes as political entities. And so I guess that presumes that the 1839 Constitution is still uh, in effect, except in the, to, you know, on the points where it has been abrogated by federal legislation, congressional legislation. Um, and so, well, treaties are abrogated, not constitutions, but our constitution is in effect um, to that point. And so Article 3, Section 1 of the 75 Constitution um, is an attempt to sort of update uh, the, 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 the document, the 1839 document, which had clearly in many respects become archaic. And so one of the first things that any constitution ever does is, is set out what the, what the criteria is. It says members of the Cherokee Nation must be citizens as proved by reference to the Dog Commission roles, including the Delaware Cherokees and the Shawnee Cherokees, right, and their descendants. So there, uh, are, there are three things mentioned here, the Dawes role, the Delaware Agreement, the Shawnee Agreement. Um, Article 4. Uh, sets up the tripartite system again, which was a system that had not been functioning for much of most of the 20th century. Uh, so we're beginning to sort of unfold at this point and, and trying to think about doing it this way again. Article 9, Section 1 uh, is establishing elections once more. We had not had elections in the Cherokee Nation for, for decades. Uh, the first election had occurred in 1971, and it had occurred because of a federal law that had been passed, or at least that's what we believed at the time. Um, and so this is, uh, now we've got to think in the Constitution about how we're going to carry forward uh, with this process. And so this is beginning to, uh, to establish how that happens. Um, Section 10 is, uh, in this article is very, very interesting. It says that no amendment or new constitution shall become effective without the approval of the President of the United States or his authorized representative. We put this in our 1975 constitution because we were told by the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, when our principal chief at that time, Ross Swimmer, presented it to the Bureau, uh, we were told that that they would have to approve it. Because this is what they do with all tribes that are organized under federal statute, either the Indian Reorganization Act or the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. The Cherokee Nation never organized under either of those statutes and still hasn't to this day. And yet the BIA still told us we would have to put BIA approval authority into our constitution. And so given that our sovereignty and our, 
our muscle <laughs> to resist had been so diminished over the last 70 years by that time, 60 years, we did. We, we put it in there. Article 16 says the provisions of this Constitution overrule and supersede the provisions of the 1839 Constitution. And that's, that's something that we have to do, right? We have to say that Constitution is no longer in effect. This is the one that now goes into effect. But by saying that it's overruling the other one and superseding the other one, this is very clearly saying that, um, that it's in the lineage of succession. This is the same government that, uh, that uh, ratified that 1839 constitution. And now that same government is ratifying this. So we want to try and finish up quickly here, but this, there are similarities with the 1839 Constitution amendments and the pre-1898 legislation because all of our laws uh, that we had developed during the 1800s were done away with by federal statute in 1898. So none of those exist anymore, right? So the ways that our 1975 Constitution was the same uh, as the 1839 was that first of all, there was no minimum blood degree requirement for citizenship. We have never had that, never in all of our existence. And you will see Cherokees by blood on the Dawes Commission rolls who are listed as having one over 256 in their blood degree, more than a hundred years ago. So that, that blood quantum has never existed for us and it doesn't exist to this day. We've always said, this was simply about political citizenship, about family, et cetera. Um, and similarly, we continued with the tripartite system of government and with the duties that were similarly outlined. Now the differences from the 1839 constitution, there, there are more of them, right? Um, there's no common land holding or references to any territory really. Uh, in the 18 or the 1975 Constitution, because all of that had been smashed, all we had were individual allotments, and to this day, all we have is property that has been reacquired um, since that time. Very importantly, there is no residency requirement either for citizenship or for voting rights. That was never. Uh, inserted into the 1975 Constitution. And that was very deliberate because that certainly existed in every previous Constitution throughout or uh, yeah, throughout the 1800s. Um, you always had to live within the boundaries, you all, you know, in order to be a citizen and to vote. No, no longer is that the case, as we know. Now, the reasons I think for this, the second is related to the first bullet here. Uh, when we had land, when we had territory, and we needed to make sure that, that we were sitting on that territory defending it, uh, there was a reason to say citizenship is limited. I mean, it was wielded coercively, no question about it, to prevent Cherokee uh, from leaving the boundaries of the nation, just saying, you will no longer be a part of this government if you do that. But by 1975, when we don't have territory, what, why would we do that? Kind of becomes the thinking. Um, maybe we can be stronger by mobilizing our people, no matter where they may be, you know, if we need to engage in political action. We can pull from all over this United States, perhaps. The, uh, the 1975 Constitution also, there's no bicameral structure to it. As we know, there's only the one legislative uh, body, the tribal council. Very importantly, <laughs> women can now vote and hold office. Yay! Uh, that obviously was very archaic about the, the old constitution. Um, but then there's also that difference that we put in that we were subject to federal approval authority and that would never have entered our minds to do that in the 1800s. Are you crazy? You know? in asserting our nationhood that we're going to let the United States tell us that, that our constitution is okay or not. Uh, no way would that have happened. 
So all of this took place in 1975. And then in 1976, in the following year, there is a, um, a court decision out of the federal courts, which involved um, a tribal councilman from the Creek Nation named Harjo. But the case applied to all of the five tribes. And several aspects of this case, one very, very significantly said, you know what, you know, any of you five tribes, uh, if you've organized under the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act, that's fine. But if you haven't, you still enjoy inherent sovereignty because you've never been terminated by, the, by federal legislation or any other way. And what that means is that you get to self-govern. You get to determine what you want in your constitution. You can create your own constitution as you know, one of the exercises of your sovereignty. And the federal government doesn't get to approve it or not. You do it, just do it. That's essentially what that decision said. And we said, oh my God, we had already put that into our constitution a year earlier. If these dates had been reversed, if this decision had come down in 75, and our constitution developed and ratified until 76, would we have ever put that article in there allowing the federal government approval for it? And there's no way we would have done that. There's no way. So this takes us up to 1975, and I'm deliberately not going any further because that's where we're headed in the next three sessions. Um, this is a four-part series on constitutions that are coming up. Um, Part two in this series uh, will cover the constitutional crisis of 1997 through 1999. It will be on February 20th, same time, and um, I'm expecting some special guests will join me perhaps. So, so with that, I will conclude my portion, and I think if we have questions at this time, you can... I think you have a place where you can start to chat, uh, to type them in, and uh, and we'll start looking at some of the questions. Okay, Julia, we do have a couple of question uh, questions. One of the first ones is, what's the best book or series of work on the history of Cherokee government? <laughs> on Cherokee government, particularly. Oh wow, um, there are several. Renard Strickland has um, written one called uh, Fire in the Spirit. And um, that one is uh, a good um, sort of overview and tra trajectory around the judicial branch in particular, but it covers uh, some of the other branches as well. Um, there is a, a scholar whose name is William McLaughlin, and he's written um, two. The first one is called What's the first one called? It's called Cherokee Renaissance in the New Republic, and the second one is called After the Trail of Tears. Now, those two are really, um, they're really dense. Um, and I don't mean dense, like stupid dense, right? I mean, they are just, there's so much information, so much detail in them um, that, you know, but they are very valuable if you can sort of swim through it. Um, so those are the ones that are kind of coming off the top of my head. I know there are a couple of other scholars who were on this, uh, this uh, webinar, and uh, if you are thinking of others, um, maybe you can send those to Kimberly as well. Okay, the other questions were in are in regard to the constitutional crisis, so you'll be dealing with those in the next webinar series. At this time, we'd like to see if anyone else has any questions. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, I think we'll call it a night, and you feel free to email us if, you, if anything comes to mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.